So we are here with Tammy for another Focus Friday. Um, you can read all about Focus Friday on the blog. Um, one of the key things about Focus Friday is that any of the advertising revenue for the month that Timmy has her blog up for this particular month before we do the, the next Focus Friday, all of the ad revenue will go towards an organization of Timmy's choice. That includes the YouTube video revenue as well started focus friday just to really start bringing those conversations home and making them relatable and making sure that we're having the difficult conversations going forward so we'd love to welcome timmy timmy do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself sure so hello everyone my name is timmy i'm an engineer i work full-time as an engineer in, an, in the automotive industry and I'm also an artist, so I do a lot of art in my free time. I also bullet journal in my free time. That's where I actually manage to plan all the art I end up doing. Um, but yeah, that's me. We were talking earlier about the art behind your head and you mentioned that you paint, are they painted? Drawn? No, so they're drawings. They're using colour and pencils. What? <laughs> <laughs> pencils wait see now i'm looking and i'm like ha what that is crazy detail with a coloring pencil thank you thank you thank you i don't even know where to put that in my brain <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself where are you from you know where have you come from have you moved around a bit Yes, yeah, so I'm Nigerian and British. I think that's how I would describe myself. So I was born in Nigeria and I lived there till I was around 10 or 11. And then I came over to England and I went through um, primary school, secondary school and sixth form uni um, in England. And yeah, so I haven't really moved around other than that. It was just Nigeria and then England. So you said you moved when you were 10. How was the, how was the transition? What was that like? So it was interesting and I think I don't think about it too much but ultimately it was harder fitting in at first because I had an accent at the time and but I think in the end it was just normal it was just you know hanging out with children the town I lived in didn't have that many black people either so it in that respect it didn't feel as much of a community as it should have but um I went to a church that had a lot of black people so I had many black friends at church for example but it was nice it was just it just felt normal growing up and you know coming from Nigeria I think there's this stigma around Nigeria as well where you know you've got all like there's just always this negative connotation about people coming from Nigeria right um I think it's interesting because I didn't notice the, ne the negative connotation so much until um, certain conversations with certain people and I think it was more to do with it was kind of outside my circle because it, and it's almost an echo chamber isn't it because all the people I knew all the Nigerian people I knew like I didn't know anyone that was of any of those negative connotations so personally I didn't think about that when I thought about Nigerian people you know um, so it was definitely an interesting way to navigate because it became actually if if this is a big part of other people's perceptions I kind of have to be careful in the way I you know, navigate myself. So it's not something I think about, and I think too much about the Nigerian excellence that I see around me or the Nigerian excellence that I see everywhere that I don't actually think about that at all. But I am aware that for some people, when they hear Nigeria, that's all they know, you know, that African prince that was sending emails that sent me a billion dollars. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a weird one, but personally, I just think about all the positives and, you know, I'm trying to bring more light to the positives. I'm trying to be another positive light so other people can see this other side of it. It's not just, you know, all the negative stereotypes that come with it. Um, <clears throat> right. So how did you get into art and bullet journaling? So for art, I did art at school, like everyone else. Um, I really enjoyed it at school. So if you're from the UK, you'll know about GCSEs, A-levels. So it's basically studying up until you're 18. So I did art up until I was 18 and then I went on to university where I studied mechanical engineering but because I did art and enjoyed it at school I really loved drawing portraits so around 2010 was when I decided to start posting my work online and even then <laughs> it's really funny to look back because my old work is not cute <laughs> but I used to have a blog where I used to post stuff and this was pre-Instagram days so DeviantArt and all the rest 
I used to post my work and that's how I got into art just sharing online and enjoying just drawing people drawing portraits and with bullet journaling it was really interesting because my sister we were having a conversation in October 2018 and we we're just talking about you know doing goals and I don't know if you've heard the saying where you can't start planning for the new year in December you need to do that three months before so you know in October we were thinking okay what are we going to do in 2019 all of this and she said something about vision board planning and she said oh yeah look on YouTube for plan with me and I was like, okay. So obviously I just went into YouTube search, plan with me. And of course our dearest Amanda Rachel's video came up and it was all about bullet journal planning. And this was, this isn't what my sister was actually referring to. But when I saw this, I was completely fascinated by the, because I've had notebooks, I've had to-do lists in several notebooks. I've always been the person that loved organizing and planning and everything. And so now that I can actually make my own planners tailored to me, tailored to everything that I need, and also have a creative outlet with it, bullet journaling just proved to be the perfect outlet for me. That's how I found bullet journaling and art was just from school. What what makes your style unique? What kind of makes your, your style you? When I think about my bullet journal style, I, I like doing realistic drawings, like you, you can see from behind me. I like drawing, you know, photorealism to an extent. But with my bullet journal, I like making it really real, but also quite accessible. So I want other people to feel like they can recreate it. I want other people to watch my plan with me and understand how I break things down to do it so that if someone else wants to learn how to do it, they also can. But with my actual bullet journal style, I like, I like it to be arty, but not too arty that it's taken all my time, you know, because I want to spend time on my full-time job and then my actual art. Um, but I think that's what's kind of cute and unique about it. Of course, with the spreads that I do, I make it completely personal as well. So for example, I've got a gratitude log where I write down one thing a day that I'm thankful about. And again, that just changes your mindset because when it comes to mental health and you know, when you get that day where you're like, oh my gosh, nothing has ever been right in my life. When you look back on your gratitude log and literally look yesterday that actually, you know, this, this good thing happened, um, it really does help. So I think that's what's cool about the bullet journal where, you know, someone can have a fitness tracker if they want that, or someone can have, I've got art brain dump pages where I just literally dump my brain with loads of art stuff and the content. Um, my unique style is just making it artistic, but also accessible, artistic, but accessible to people. That I think that's great, though, making artistic and accessible, because I think people, yeah. I think people tend to forget that with journaling and art you know it looks so amazing like I look at I look at those pictures behind your head and I'm like eh, I'm not ever gonna I, there is no way on this planet that I am ever going to be able to do something in that space but what makes it accessible is you know you then show people that actually regardless of your talent or regardless of your skill set there's things that you can take from this and use it in your own creative style so exactly. that you know that accessibility thing is so important and i think people forget that in the bullet journaling community is you've got to kind of make it your own style and i think it's what works for everyone as well like if you're interested in actually helping other people to learn and to grow and to develop their own you know artist artistic skill then that's something that i try to focus on but of course if you want to create masterpieces in your journal that you can literally look back and be like oh my gosh this is incredible i think that's amazing as well and on the other hand if you want to do completely minimal spreads that have no doodles at all that's it, that's great as well you know it's it's literally what's so good about the bullet journal you can do whatever you want in your bullet journal <laughs> So you started a art blog um, back in forever ago when there was still deviant art. Um, what prompted the idea? What got you into that? So I, one of my biggest inspirations when it comes to art is his name is Calvin Okafo, and he's also another Nigerian Brit who does art, and he does incredible photorealistic drawings. If you don't know about him, definitely have a look. He is amazing, and okay. he. Calvin Akafo. Calvin, Calvin, Calvin. 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 Okay. Yeah, Calvin. And then O-K-A-F-O-R. But he is absolutely incredible. Exactly. 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 That's the face I like to see. <laughs> but yeah, he was literally one of the first few people and he used to post 
stages of his drawings on a blog. So when I saw that, obviously I, he was a massive inspiration to me as well. At that time, I only used to do graphite pencil drawings. So it was around my GCSE times. And, you know, I was just like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. So I also started posting stages of my own drawing and it just rose from my biggest idol when it comes to art is doing this. So I want to do it too. So. <laughs> yeah, but he's honestly massive inspiration for me. Okay, so tell me a little bit about some of the challenges you faced building your business as a woman of colour. In terms of challenges, I think for me, it was almost looking around and not really seeing many people like me. So there was a time, for example, when I first started my inspirations, as I said, Calvin O'Castle was a massive inspiration and someone called Heather Rooney, again, amazing portraits. And But there really wasn't really anyone like me that was doing the kind of portraits I do now, for example just drawing black women and their beauty or doing um or anyone that looked like me so it was good to have kelvin from that perspective because a lot of it'll be a bit weird to explain but a lot of nigerian parents are more against creative fields so my parents didn't actually push this narrative onto me at all but a lot of nigerian parents will say things like you need to be a doctor you need to be a lawyer you need to be an engineer so when they've got a child that is interested in something like art it's not something that they encourage them to pursue. Some of some parents do stop them, but I know from friends and people um, that I had around me. But for me personally, I don't know if that was one of the reasons why there weren't many, you know, black people, black women that I saw that were in the art field. So in terms of challenges, it was, you know, looking around me and not really seeing people that looked like me, that were fellow artists or people that drew people that looked like me. Because a lot of people, a lot of artists anyway, shy away from drawing black people and it's harder technically because um even if you're doing a graphite drawing where if you're drawing someone of lighter skin you can just put a few shadows and you're going to get the main form and it looks like them you know if you're drawing a white paper but for black people you need to put a lot more tone that was very evident to me when i did a self-portrait at school because everyone else in the class it was easy, even the teacher, it was easy just, you know, put 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 this graphite here and there and that was it. And for me, it was like, I, I felt like I was building and building because obviously you need to get the tonal value. It was a black and white portrait. But um, that was a challenge for me because I couldn't really see inspiration in that respect. But the good thing is this was more of a past. So now there are many, there are many people that I can see around me. And also I'm happy that I can also inspire many people. Like the comments I get till today on my YouTube, that's just like, oh my gosh, I love the fact that you're teaching us how to do this, how to draw black people, how to even being a black woman doing this, um, I know serves as a source of inspiration. That makes me feel proud. That makes me feel happy. And I'm happy that 10 years ago, Although I was in the unfortunate situation where I didn't have that, I'm happy that now I can be that to someone. So. You've just joined the Art and Olive Design team. Um, tell me a little bit more about the experience and what you're hoping to bring to the design team. So I've literally recently joined. And for me, firstly, to even be able to join is incredible. So I was saying it to you earlier that it was on my vision board from the start of the year. And this is something that I put, I literally cut round, put their logo down on my vision board, like in some way, somehow I'm going to work with them in 2020. And you know, that's happened. And for me, that's already incredible. But um, in terms of what I bring, I just hope that I can bring my unique style. I hope I can bring my unique art style as well. Cause obviously along with my bullet journal stuff, I do my actual art stuff. So hopefully, um, Hopefully there's a voice that I can fill. And I know a lot of the people in the design team are talented, amazing artists. So even to be a part of that community just feels like an honor in itself. But I just hope that, you know, my little two pence <laughs> can add um, to it and just, just add to the community. I'm excited for it. You have also just started an amazing Instagram page highlighting black bullet journalists and planners Tell me a little bit more about this. Yes, so that all started when Marsha, do you salute on Instagram? She um, contacted me on Instagram and she was just like, oh, would you like to use the hashtag Black Girl Bujo in your post? Because obviously she just found that, you know, there are not many black girls at Bullet Journal. 
and I thought oh my gosh this is amazing we were talking in the DMs but then we were talking on the phone for hours and it was so incredible because it was like we had the same vision it was like where are the black people the village journal because when you look at the community if it's not something you think about you you literally don't even notice anyone and to be honest before starting the page I can't actually say many black bullet journalists at all in fact the only one I can probably say is a friend I know in real life who I introduced to bullet journaling I honestly didn't really know anyone else which is quite sad but that's where the idea for the page kind of came up she suggested using a hashtag and I thought actually what if we had a page where we would post and basically amplify our voices and uplift uplift the black people that do bullet journal and that's how the page came along and honestly it's it's incredible to see the support that it's received like in a few days so many people shared it it got 2000 followers in a few days and it was like mind blown because honestly we didn't expect that level of support and just to see that other people were keen on the idea and it was like a oh my gosh finally it it just felt amazing to see and of course there's so many talented bullet journal artists there's so many talented people the bullet journal anyway but i think part of creating the page was creating a community for us but also just showcasing what we've got and um Marsha was even saying that there was a time she was looking for maybe black history month spread there's sometimes specific things that you would look for and just not be able to find it where if you go on Pinterest you can type in June bullet journal butterfly bullet journal and find so many spreads you know you can type something black related and literally find nothing and hopefully we're trying to fill that void where if you want to find something specific or even just be introduced to loads of other talented artists you can there's like one space to be able to see all of that um okay tell me a little bit about a time when you were treated differently because of your skin color so thinking about this i think when and probably a lot of people do this but when I go through traumatic experiences my mind just kind of blocks things out so it's like a fight or flight kind of thing where I don't want to remember it so I was thinking about what experiences I could share and I couldn't really bring any to surface Um, but there was something that happened recently um, that I can share and unfortunately it was it was in a supermarket and it was in fact it's fine to share it (laughs) Okay, so it was in a supermarket and essentially I wasn't being listened to. I think that's what I'll bring it down to. So um, the whole the whole premise of it was me trying to return an item and the person, the manager I was speaking to, didn't understand what I was saying, but also didn't want to listen to me. And I think it does come down to that because the reality is the hostility that I face when um, with just my conversation, I find the hostility I face I feel is different to if it was a white woman that was having that conversation with the person and I say that because I had to be especially calm I had to be especially my voice had to be as neutral as possible or it would have escalated and in that situation it was a very minor situation at first but then it turned into a shouting match where it honestly felt unbelievable because as I said it was a very minor situation and for me it was like you didn't understand what was you didn't understand this technology i think that's how i'll just put it down to you. you didn't understand this technology so you weren't trying to listen to what i was saying but in relation to race i really do believe that if it wasn't me portraying this message or trying to explain this to him i think it would have i think i would have been treated differently and i don't know even with this story it's kind of hard to explain without going into the proper details but when i really thought about it that's all I could put it down to, you know? So you've almost got to be like hyper vigilant about how you're talking to people because that that's crazy that you've got to almost monitor the tone of voice just to make sure that things don't escalate. Exactly. And you can see other people. And in fact, it happens so much where you literally see clips on social media where, you know, you have, say, a white person or anyone else, you know, just give, bring in as much energy. But even with police, not to make this into an extreme, <laughs> an extreme example, but even with um, like protesters, for example, where you, you see, I think like the week before, white protesters were protesting about not wanting to 
quarantine anymore or whatever. I need my haircut or whatever. And they're literally in the police's face like this. And, oh, and they've got the big anything. guns and they're storming stuff and they're doing... Exactly. Crazy. And the police is acting like, oh yeah, this is a normal day. And then you get the black people who aren't doing any of that. But it's immediate with the... It's honestly, you know, I think in that respect and just to mirror it to my situation, it's like you have to be calm and it's funny because I spoke to my mum straight after that incident happened and she was like just whatever you just make sure that you remain calm you're and it's funny because for all of us we have to know that instantly if you start if your if your volume no matter how angry you might be if your volume raises it's a it's a no-go because it just it, it escalates to the other end and it's sad because you can't even express your anger you can't express your sadness or your frustration you have to minimize it so that you can actually have a normal conversation it's it's very it's a very strange dynamic but it's something that i've noticed and unfortunately i will probably have to deal with again in the future so if you could go back and talk to your younger self what are some of the things you would tell yourself so I think I would just say to myself that firstly, your art gets better because <laughs> whatever I was doing back in the day was <laughs> was not it. But um, I think most of all, I would just say that, you know, you, you will become more self-confident. So all the bullying and anything else that I faced in the past that would have really affected me and how I, um, that would have affected how I present myself in the world. Um, you don't need to focus on that because your voice will be heard. You will inspire thousands of people. It's incredible for me right now to see what my art is doing, like on behalf of me with people just being inspired to draw, inspired to do whatever. But I would just tell my younger self that no need to worry about any of the minor issues right now. It does get better. You're about to create a massive voice that's going to inspire thousands. So don't worry. Don't worry, girl. <laughs> it has been a rapid time of change at the moment. We've had COVID-19, which has thrown many a spanner in the works. Um, Black Life Matters movement has really come to the fore. Um, people are really taking notice and really starting to get behind it as well. What are some of the things you're doing to navigate this at the moment? So personally for me, with everything that's been going on, it's been so difficult. It's been incredibly difficult. So with COVID-19, I've been working from home for literally the past three months, which has been good to be fair. I have enjoyed it because no petrol cost, you know, no commuting time. It's all good, I don't mind. Wake up a few minutes before, quickly freshen up and start work, I don't mind. But um, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's come to light, it affected my mental health greatly. I couldn't. I could no longer just go on Twitter and scroll for jokes and banter that I would normally get on a normal day. It was, Twitter turned into this awful morbid place because everything that was being shared, and rightfully so, because we did need to shine light on it, but everything that was being shared almost got overwhelming. And personally, what I did to help navigate was just to take myself off social media for a while. I had to, it's hard because with the art that I do and with the content that I create online, I am constantly on social media because I need to, you know, keep my followers engaged. But I also had to just decide that, okay, I'm posting and going. I, no, you know, scrolling for, for hours that would get me back into a really sad, sad place. Because I think for me as well, what was hard with racism that happens in England is very covert. So for me and a lot of my friends, it just brought out this underlying it brought out an underlying hurt where it's not just looking at the racism happening in America, it was almost mirroring it to everything that's happened in our own lives and literally just realizing that, oh my gosh, and everything just almost spoiled onto the surface. And it felt like too much, honestly. My mental health was awful for a couple of weeks. But to help, as I said, I just went off social media. I tried to do more within myself and with the people around me, with people I love. I was just creating art and just doing the things that I love to do without feeling without feeling the pressure of everything that was going on on social media. I really wanted to do um, a piece in tribute of George Floyd, but honestly, and also it was it was George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and um, Ahmaud Arbery, and I just couldn't. It was so heavy on my heart. Honestly, I couldn't do it. And in the end, I did do, um, in the end, in the end, I did do a Black Lives Matter piece but it didn't feel as heavy. I felt like I needed time to really 
navigate what was going on for myself and then finally put my not so much pain I find it hard to put my pain into art but almost to put my passion into art and yeah I created a powerful piece which um, a lot of people appreciated so I appreciated that as well but yeah ultimately I would say for anyone that might still be going through those emotions just take yourself out of social media and just think and reflect with people around you if you don't have people around you because you might be quarantined um speak to people facetime people just talk to your friends and don't try to have those conversations all the time so i found it more draining when you know i'm talking to a friend and we're going back and forth like yes and then this and almost reminiscing and remembering all the bad things i think when you just kind of not ignore it but push it to the side to then focus on more positive things that's almost the best thing that you can do with all of the things happening right now it's so important to remember self-care and mm -hmm. take time out to kind of re-establish your values and experience that is 2020 um i think it's probably you know if we look in five years from now i think 2020 is going to be a huge shift in the way that we change the way we talk about things and change the way we do things and change the way we live lives like you know i don't you know i don't want to stay i don't want to go back to normal i want a new normal and i want to be part of the movement that changes the normal i completely agree I think 2020 is so funny because at the start of 2020, it was very much like this is the year 2020 vision. And I really feel like we have 2020 vision now because a lot of things that would normally be hidden or a lot of things that would be ignored or a lot of things that people would just carry on with life and pretend isn't happening. Now everything's brought to light. Literally everyone's got their 2020 glasses on and we're looking at things more clearly. So just like you said, we're going to look back on 2020 and notice a shift. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think almost the quarantine and covid made it better that that all of this came to light because you couldn't really hide away from it you couldn't just then go out and you know go to russia and do whatever that you would normally do like everyone almost had to face this because everyone was literally at home or you know and in a weird way i think that was a positive because even thinking about how this would have been dealt if i was still going into the office i feel like it would be completely different so just like you said, 2020 is definitely a year that will go down in the books. I think 2020 is something that even so far, of course, it's been a learning curve. And of course, it's been hard emotionally. It's been draining physically, mentally, it's been draining. But ultimately, I think the growth that comes back comes out of it. I think growing pains is something that, you know, you don't want it, but it's like you, you use it to grow through things. So, yeah, I think ultimately it's like a weird positive switch at the end because the new normal is going to be so much better so you know let's go through the pain to get to get to to get everyone to the same understanding to get everyone there and then we can move forward hopefully you have had an amazing response to some of the messages you've posted um to instagram and especially a, an amazing response around um the bullet journal page that you guys have set up um what are some of the key messages you hope people are taking away with them i think with especially with the black lives matter movement i think a lot of people um harbor a lot of guilt so they almost don't want to hear it and um ultimately i think it also comes down to people thinking that it might be an attention seeking kind of thing like why do you need you know your own thing and ultimately i just want people to know that it's not about bringing attention to something for no reason there's a reason why this attention is being brought and if everyone was treated fairly in the first place if everyone was treated equally we wouldn't need a movement and most of all if you don't have a movement you should be happy you don't need a movement rather than thinking oh where's my own special treatment because the reality is for some people there's been no treatment whatsoever so you know any any focus on anything to make things more equal shouldn't be a what about my own it should be a actually for the past for my entire life i've been i've been living comfortably other people haven't and you know when when i hear people say oh we're all the same you know i don't see color to me it's very annoying because it's like you're minimizing someone else's struggles if you don't see color and if you won't treat someone differently because of their color that's fantastic 
but there's there's such a thing as systemic racism so society already treats people different for their color and if you decide to not see color that's all good and well but just know that you're not helping the people that society is hurting essentially and i just think people need to get out of their heads and get get out of a selfish mentality of oh but then the attention is going away from me but the attention is almost been on you at 80% and everyone else at 10%. So now let's let's make it a little bit more equal, you know? Um, and most of all, I appreciate all the support with um, the Bullet Journal page and everything else. And I think most of all with 2020, 20, people are really opening their eyes to see some of the inequality. It's usually hard to put yourself in someone else's shoes on a normal day because if you don't see colour and if you think everyone's the same, of course, like what's someone complaining about? But hopefully this has brought enough light to it that people are now realizing that okay you know what there has been some injustice there has been you know inequality let's let's do what we can individually to hopefully amplify who needs to be amplified help who needs to be helped let's um put more attention on this to hopefully promote and provoke change um what are some of the things or what is the one thing you wish you could tell people to make them more aware about racism and combat racism within themselves as well um, most of all, I would just say people should listen. So if someone, if basically the oppressed is speaking about whatever situation they're going through, um, people need to listen with an open mind. And of course, if it's something you can't relate to, it'll be hard for you to put yourself in the boat and really understand what the person's saying. But I think listening goes a big way because it's no longer a argument i think like that there was a conversation i had with someone that got me so drained because i was trying to explain all my experiences i had an incident that happened at work and i was trying to explain it and the person just came back with of course this and just minimizing everything i was saying and to me it was like i don't want to speak about my experience anymore because you're not going to listen to me so i know how far listening goes because people almost need to listen without saying a rebuttal or saying a but this just listen and keep your mouth shut basically that's what i want everyone to do okay so as part of the listening i think there are a lot of microaggressions and things that people aren't necessarily aware of um racism is this massive thing where a lot of people just think oh i don't say the n-word i'm not racist but that's not all and i think when people just like i said if if someone tells you they're offended by something you say you need to then go back and reflect instead of thinking oh but i didn't do this so instead of thinking oh i didn't do the most extreme form of racism just think what i did do might have come across racist so let me do something to change that um and yeah people just need to look in, inwardly towards themselves and just realize that if like it doesn't matter if it won't necessarily offend you and it doesn't matter if you've got one black friend that it didn't offend that doesn't mean that this other black person you said it to won't take offense um it's it's almost the not painting everyone with the same brush and it's not just about black people it's other races as well but if you paint everyone with the same brush then you think something that you can say to someone who might not necessarily be offended you can say that to everyone and it won't be the same um response and i think what it comes down to as well is when when people say the whole oh but um i've got my sister's work my sister's neighbors you know best friends black so i could say the n word and you're like but it's not you know it's not it's not the same in that respect because they might not be offended but someone else might punch you for that so you know i think people just need to realize that every situation they have with everyone every situation they have with every single black person is a unique situation so listen to what they're saying if they're offended by what you're saying then remove that from your vocab basically and just think about think about what you're saying before you say it think about what possible repercussions it can have on that person um and even if you won't necessarily be offended that's all good and well but listen to what they're saying i think it just comes down to listening <laughs> i think that's the key because if you don't feel it within yourself then you won't see a problem but if someone else tells you then you need to listen understand and then not do it again and i think what i would add to that as well is to educate yourself because it's also not the black person's job to educate you so if you don't understand something guess what google.com is free so you can even ask Siri, <laughs> like it's, it's all free and, and accessible to everyone. So instead of coming from the ignorant in front of, I didn't know, I feel like in 2020, no one has a right to be ignorant anymore because if you wanted to know something, you could have found out. So, you know, 
also educate yourself. So as you know, the advertising revenue collected from the blog post and the YouTube video are going to go to an organization of your choice. Which organization have you selected? And do you want to tell us a little bit more about them? Yes, um, I've selected Justice for Black Lives. It's a UK based organization and they do protests and just try to raise money for different UK based issues. So at the moment they're raising money for Belly Mujinga. So she worked for the Transport for London. Someone spat on her. She contracted COVID and died from it like three or four days later. Honestly, so sad. And it's just trying to raise money for her family to help with funeral costs and everything else. So it's a it's a UK based movement and that's what they raise the money for presently. Really appreciative of your time today, Timmy. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and sharing your your story and sharing your business and sharing all of these amazing things that you did with us today. I really appreciate you kind of having these conversations with me as well. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for creating this platform as well just to amplify voices of who needs to be heard. I really appreciate you having me on here.